thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure today to rise to speak very proudly in favour of the Reform Act introduced by my friend and colleague, the Member of Parliament for Wellington Halton Hills. At the outset, I'd like to commend him for the substance of this bill and the substantive debate that he has caused both here in this House of Commons and across the country, as well as the manner and the process that he has followed in presenting his reforms. He presented a first version of this bill last year and sought meaningful input from members of Parliament, Canadians across the country. In fact, I can personally attest to the fact that he came to my constituency and engaged directly with many people in the riding. It was an excellent example of real citizen engagement. I want to thank him for that. After receiving all of this input, he proposed two different sets of amendments. Uh, one he proposed is Reform Act 2014, and the second, I believe, on September the 11th. And it's my understanding that the government, as well as members of the opposition, will be supporting the bill. He did make a real effort to hear constructive criticism of the bill. I know that there are people there who are supportive of this legislation who wish that he would have kept it in its original form. And I say to him that he has shown some courage and he has shown some real flexibility in trying to get a piece of legislation that can be supported by a majority of the members of this House and hopefully a majority of the members of the Senate as well. To just review the Reform Act itself, the Reform Act proposed three main reforms, restoring local control over party nominations, strengthening caucus as a decision-making body, and reinforcing the accountability of party leaders to their caucuses. The purpose of these reforms is to strengthen Canada's democratic institutions by restoring the role of elected members of Parliament in the House of Commons. The proposals in the Reform Act would reinforce the principle of responsible government, something that I will return to over and over again in this speech. It would make the executive more accountable to the legislature and ensure that party leaders maintain the confidence of their caucuses, something that has existed, in fact, since uh, Parliament began. In fact, if one wants to review, especially on the Conservative side of the House, an excellent example of party leaders must maintaining the confidence of their caucus, one only has to go back to perhaps the greatest parliamentarian of all time, Winston Churchill, who became Prime Minister during World War II at a period at which someone else held a majority of the seats of the House of Commons. The Conservative government had a majority of the seats of the House of Commons. Churchill was in fact not party leader, but that change was made. I think for all of our sakes, it was a much better change. That's certainly a historical example, especially for Conservative parliamentarians. Responsible government, as we know, is the principle that the Executive Council, the Cabinet, is responsible and accountable to the Executive Legislative Assembly, the House of Commons, not the appointed governor. This was, in fact, a change that was made in Canadian history. Now, much of this debate is focused upon present-day situation or about the concentration of power that has occurred over the past 40 years. But I want to commend the member for Halton because he has, in fact, tried to say this is a fundamental realigning of Parliament that one has to go beyond the present personalities and the present circumstances of today. We all have our present-day debates, but we need to think fundamentally of that relationship between the executive and the legislative. This is something that has perplexed, frankly, political thinkers since the advent of political activity and political organization, since people started distinguishing between the different roles that the executive and the legislative are those who dispense funds and those who raise funds ought to have. Now why is it so important to restore the proper balance between the executive and the legislative? Why should we care about responsible government? Because in my view democracy is the best form of government, to turn around one of Churchill's phrase, it's the best form of government, and in my view parliamentary democracy is the best form of democracy. But in order to truly be a parliamentary democracy, it must both be representative and responsible. It must be representative in that the legislative branch, members of parliament, must be duly elected and accountable to their constituents. It must be responsible in that the executive branch, the cabinet, the government, must be accountable to those legislatures. It requires those two absolute functions. If one surveys the early histories of parliaments, as I've done recently, especially uh, excellent works like J.R. Maddicott's The Origins of the English Parliament, I recommend it to everyone in this place and, and everyone across the country, one will actually see that the powers of the executive during those early parliaments, the king or queen, actually existed outside of parliament. And they were challenged at that time. Of course, parliament started as sort of a council of advisors, uh, some from the moneyed property classes, some from the uh, ecclesiastical classes. Even then at that time, they started two important functions which we continue today, which is they started challenging the sovereign with respect to the raising of money, taxes, most often to fight wars, uh, 
and with respect to the review of spending. So these two essential functions, which Parliament still fulfills today in terms of ways and means motions and estimates process, actually started centuries ago in these early parliaments. But at that time, the executive power actually resided outside of Parliament in the sense of it resided with the king or with the queen. What happened over time was that these executive powers moved in effect from the crown to the advisors of the crown, the privy councillors, as they're still called today, and then over time, especially to ministers of cabinet and the prime minister within the legislature. This was a very fundamental change that occurred over many, many, many years. Is this wrong? Now, some may perceive there's an actual problem with this, and in fact, the Americans, in my view, saw this as a problem and chose a different system. They opted for a different system and separated very formally the executive, the president, and the administration completely separate from the Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives. It is very straightforward to ensure formal responsibility between the executive branch and the legislative branch. It is also simple to ensure that American citizens can have, in fact, more than one vote and can split their votes. They split the votes between a vote for the president, vote for the member of the Senate, or the member of the representatives. In Canada, as you know, members have one vote. They have a vote for their member of parliament at the federal level. But I do not see this as a problem, having the executive within the legislature. In fact, I think it's a benefit. I think it's one of the beauties of the parliamentary system is that it is organic. As Edmund Burke would say, the parliamentary system, one of its advantages is, is it, is, it is organic. It can respond to situations. It is, in fact, a benefit to have the executive residing within the legislature. But what needs to happen then is responsible government. You need to ensure, and all parliamentary democracies must ensure, with this real transfer through the history of executive power from the sovereign to the privy council, the cabinet, the prime minister, the executive clearly resides within the legislature, but we have to have responsible government where the executive, which resides within the legislature, is responsible to the legislature. It's much more complicated than the American system. I think it's better than the American system, but we must ensure that responsible government applies. Now, in my time remaining, Mr. Speaker, I want to address some of the concerns that have been raised. And it's very difficult to do so because some of the concerns that were raised by people who have raised issues about political parties have raised concerns. I think members of all political parties have raised concerns about MPs possibly usurping some of the role of political partisans in terms of selecting or deselecting leaders. But this role of caucus in terms of being responsible, having responsibility for the leadership is always been there throughout history and in my view is caucus members will respond in a very meaningful way to it. I was in a situation in my first uh, term in Parliament where in fact we had a very destabilizing situation. It would have been helpful in fact to have a set of rules to guide us in terms of how to deal with that in a much quicker way. Secondly, I would just appeal to those who say that the bill has been amended too much and, it, and not enough has retained from the original bill to pass. I would appeal to them and say that the member from Halton Hills has introduced a piece of legislation, has tried to be as constructive as he can to get support from all political parties so it has near unanimous support to pass this House. I therefore ask all members of Parliament to support this important bill to redress the imbalance that has occurred over decades in this country where the powers of the executive have grown and the strength of the legislative branch unfortunately has diminished. We need to restore the proper balance between the executive and the legislative. A true parliamentary democracy requires representative institutions, but it also requires responsible government. We need to honour these fundamental traditions of our parliamentary democracy. Thank you very much for your, for your time, Mr. Speaker.